So welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by Liam Ford, who is a CEO and founder of The Zone Global. And we've just been having a chat in my office for about the last hour and a half or so <laughs> about life, the universe and everything. So super excited to find out um, from Liam for you some of the things that he has experienced in his lifetime. Welcome. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, Deborah. It's really great to be here. And of course, you know, I'm a fan of EOS, so yes. so uh, I don't need to plug it, but I, I always will. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, so I like to always ask our, our guests to give us a little bit of a history about themselves, so their their background, where they came from, and a personal professional best that you've cool. had in your life. Yeah, well, I was born in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I came from a very uh, modest, poor family, in fact, you know, and so if I look at where I am today, I never would have predicted that I would have got to where I am today based on where I was born, how I was, how I was born into. I was born into a very violent family yeah. and uh, disruptive. So when I was a kid, I was, I was sort of like a bit of a scaredy pants, you know, like, <laughs> I'd be just like behind my mum's skirt. Um, and, you know, that, that takes a lot to get through uh, over life. Um, but uh, she has been or she was my rock because she was the kindest person I know and the kindest person I know today in my family. I mean, I'd come home and there'd be people sitting around the dinner table I'd never met before. And she'd say, oh, I just found them on the street and they looked hungry. So I made them dinner. And, then, you know, I'd see people steal stuff. And I'd say, hey, mum, that person just talked. She said, they probably need it more than me. Wow. That's and an and so, lady. yeah, that was a, yeah. Bit of my, a, a bit of my background. And then uh, I started off wanting to be a vet. So I went down to Massey University, for those of you who know, which is this little little town down in, in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> middle of nowhere <laughs> yeah. bloody freezing. And, um, but I, I, I really found that uh, I loved animals too much. And being a vet, you have to be sort of like quite uh, tall mm -hmm. and removed from it. Yep. Not that I'm saying vets don't love animals, they do, but I couldn't do that. Well, you can't afford to get involved on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. It would destroy you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. That's, that's, what, that's what I found. So I ended up... Uh, then doing a, a science degree. And as part of that, I did psychology and I, I found that really, really interesting. So anyway, I left New Zealand at, I don't know, 20 or when I finished my degree, um, got on an OE, went to Australia, worked on a building site, made some money, went to the UK. And then I stumbled into starting my own business or becoming part of a business, which was in the recruitment area. Recruitment really? Yeah, yeah, it okay. was really crazy. I just liked people. And anyway, I grew that business to, um, it was about a $30 million business um, and we had 600 people. Uh, so I, I grew quite a large business and I realized, that, you know, I was quite a good entrepreneur. But <laughs> the real story is that um, I came back to New Zealand uh, and I was at a party with my cousin's place and, you know, I was sort of big noting and oh, I've got this business. And this, this is quite a few years ago now, yeah. like maybe 25 years ago. And he called, me aside, he called me aside and he said, mate, mate. And I said, what's that? He said, you've turned into an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I was like, shit, I have, right? Yep. And I realized that, you know, I'd left New Zealand this sort of like, you know, entrepreneurial sort of uh, Kiwi kid. And I'd actually let, you know, fame and fortune go to my head. And I had, I'd turned into an asshole. I really honestly, and I looked at myself in the mirror and I went, wow. This is not who I want to be. And so I decided to change everything. And so I then reinvented myself and started a new business here in New Zealand, which was all about helping people become uh, reaching their full potential. Mm. Uh, and that was the precursor uh, to the zone where, where I'm currently now, and which is about helping organizations become exceptional. Mm. So so that was my story about getting to uh, becoming the CEO and founder of The Zone. That's been now since 1999. Okay. Uh, I've worked in 35 different countries around the world Wow! with hundreds of different types of companies and thousands of different people. And it's been a real journey of joy, helping people become, you know, exceptional leaders, exceptional teams and exceptional organizations rather than being sort of mediocre and just accepting that this is this is okay yeah and a lot of that's about uh, making them more human so our sort of ethos is become exceptional by being more human i love it 
So you must have worked with some really interesting companies, been 35 countries around the world, all <laughs> yeah. of businesses, and it's generally the bigger businesses that you work with, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So we've uh, we've created a niche with the, with the sort of the larger businesses. So most of our businesses we work with are like 500 to you know 20,000 people. Yeah. We, we, we could work with bigger companies uh, if we want. I've got a team of like now 17 people around the world. And uh, we enjoy that because two reasons, because you're making a bigger impact. Mm -hmm. So you're making an impact on a larger number of people. Yeah. And why I enjoy working with organizations is because they get behind borders. So a lot of the companies we work with are multi, uh, you know, country organizations, they're yeah. global organizations. They might be in 10, 20 different places. So, you know, one of my favorite uh, jobs was, back in about 2011, when we had, you know, 19,000 people in 14 countries, and we completely changed the culture of the organization. Across all those borders. Across all those borders. by And how we did it was, you might say, how the hell did you do that? Yeah, yeah. You know? That's my next uh, question, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but what we did, we, we trained 150 of their people. So we have a uh, technology we call the Zone Way, mm -hmm. which is a way of engaging and upscaling and 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 making organisations and teams and leaders exceptional. And we trained them in that methodology, but we started with a methodology called appreciative inquiry. And for those of you who don't know what appreciative inquiry is, it, it, it's based on uh, positive psychology. So if you go into a into a room and ask people what's wrong. Yeah, they, they, they love telling you what's wrong with the business, right? They'll say, oh, this is wrong, that's wrong, this is terrible. Um, but what this researcher found is that when he was doing uh, research on this, uh, he found that the number of people coming to see him to tell what the business wrong started to decline and nothing really changed in the business, right? So he thought, I wonder if it's the way I'm asking the questions. So then he asked some neutral questions, and, you know, the attendance went up, but still started to taper off. And they thought, I wonder what would have happened if I asked just positive questions, like when we're at our best, what do you see? Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, when you're at your best, what do you see? And, you know, what are the things that really enable people to be at their best here? And what he noticed was people went away feeling energized, excited, and more and more people were queuing up to come and do an really? interview with. Yeah. Okay. And, um, what he found is through that process alone, change started to happen because he was changing our natural human lens from looking for what's wrong mm -hmm. to looking at what's right. Because we're, you know, we're we're uh, we're naturally wired to look for the dangers yes. because it's a survival technique, right? Yeah. So when you ask people to look for the positives, you get a whole different mindset, and people start then looking at all the positives in what they do, and they do more of the positive things which means there's naturally less time to do the, the negative things, yeah, right? So yeah. you just get rid of those naturally. <laughs> and it's still, you still need to lean into some things that are broken. Sure. But it's a different mindset. So yeah. that, that's, that's that good. was pretty interesting. I think it's part of what we employ in the whole Level 10 meeting, which you start off with a, um, a, a so we call, it, call it good news. The very right. first part of the agenda is good news, personal, professional. And the idea is just to get people in that positive kind of mindset and thinking yep. about working on things rather than the being down in the in the the. the You've got the fires. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, there's a really good talk uh, that was done by a guy called Sean Accor. It's, 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 I think, about 2014 now. It's a TED talk. Right. Watch that. So, you know, uh, if you put that in your show notes, it's yeah, a we'll TED talk that. by Sh And it's called The Happy, the Happy Secret to Better Work. Right. And it's one that we show a lot of our clients, all of our clients. And it's all about a uh, positive mindset gives you positive results. Mm-hmm. And it, he's got a lot of research and a lot of data that, that, that actually backs that up. So, and it's a really funny talk too. So okay, it's, it's worth watching. I should pop that in the links. Wonderful. Okay. So in terms of, you know, working with all these different businesses, what are some of the challenges that you've seen in these businesses as they, because they're all continuing to grow, aren't they? Yeah. 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 So they're all, they're all primarily growth businesses. Yep. Um, and what you find is, it's probably no different than the small business, to be honest, just at, just at a different scale. So yep. we can share notes on this. But as they grow, uh, I'll, I'll tell a story that I tell, which might uh, amplify it a little bit, which is you have three riders on the back of an elephant. Yep. And one wants to go straight ahead. 
one wants to go left and one wants to go right. So, you know, the one that's trying to maneuver the elephant straight ahead and one at the back wants to go left. One at the, what, and so the elephant's getting confusing messages about direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what does an elephant do when it has confusing messages? Do you know? Well, it sit down? I don't know. That's what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, almost. It stops. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you think of the elephant as your organization yes. and the three riders on the back as your leadership team or, or your leaders in your team, if you have you know, uh, messages that are misaligned or you have misalignment at the top, yep. it's going to slow your organization down or stop it because what people naturally do, they want to do a good job. Mm -hmm. So if one of the leaders is saying, this is our KPIs, and one of the leaders is saying, this is our KPI, and one of the others is saying, oh, no, this is our KPI. If one of the leaders is moving at 10 miles an hour, the other one at 20, the other one at 50, yep. that's exactly what happens. So your organization slows down and people are then confused and they go, oh, Deborah, what am I supposed to do here? Even though they would naturally know if the messages were aligned. Yep. And so what you do is you, you hamstring your organization. You, you actually tamper it. Yep. You disable it. And that's what I find in the big organizations because they have a big chain of communication from top to bottom. So it's like that old, um, you know, whispers game where you sort of whisper. Chinese whispers, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, where you, you whisper something in one ear and by the time it comes around to you, it's it's a completely different message. Message. So that's what I find is one of the areas. Um, the second area is um, culture. So quite often cultures will start to form in the organization because of these silos. So you'll have a different culture in finance, a different mm. culture in marketing, a different culture in sales, a different culture in operations. And, and it, that creates another set of silos and misalignment. Then, that, then in order to try and um, solve for that problem, they introduce bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> so then they yep. over-process things. Yes. So then there's a SOP or a process for everything, and then everything slows down even more. And then you have to have meetings before the meeting, to check whether we, you know, the politics are right. Then there's the meeting, and then there's the meeting after the meeting, and then there's. The, I mean, <laughs> it just reminds me, it reminds me of my twelve months at council. Sorry, I worked, <laughs> for my sins, I worked twelve months at the Auckland City Council. Oh, it was right. exactly like that. Right. Yeah. Well, yep. that's that's the problem with big organisations, and mm -hmm. it's about it's about getting rid of all that BS. Yeah. Getting rid of the bureaucracy, uh, getting rid of the misalignment, getting rid of the agendas, right? And and yep. I use an analogy um, of a fishbowl for your culture. Mm -hmm. So I say, okay, so imagine you've got this fishbowl and um, every time you uh, add a bit of bureaucracy or politics or hidden agendas or miscommunication, that's polluting the water, mm. right? So you have this fantastic fish that's in the water and she's come in from the best university. She's super resilient. Like she wants to change the world and she's like, yay, let's get in there. Yeah. And then she gets, you know, oh, I'm too busy for you. Or, oh, you have to have 10 signatures to do that. Oh, you, you know, you have to, there's a meeting before the, and so this water starts getting polluted and the fish starts to get sick. Mm. Now, what do you do when the fish starts to get sick in polluted water? You change the water or do you change the fish? Mm. Now, what you find is corporations do is they change the fish, <laughs> right? When you ask kids, you now I go to schools and I ask kids this and I say, hey, what do you do? And they go, Change the, the water, water. <laughs> right? Instead, and, and this is what happens in, in big organizations. The water gets cloudy, mm -hmm. miscommunications, bureaucracy, and all those things. They start to dirty the water. The fish start getting sick, sick of work, sick of all the BS. Mm -hmm. And then they start talking behind the water cooler or the seaweed, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And guess what? Then they become part of the problem. Yep. And then they're actually polluting the water themselves. And when they realize that, they go, wow. And then they leave. And that's what happens when you have this talent or brain drain. And mm. it can happen the same for countries. Yep. You know, Like in New Zealand, they say it's happening right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like mm -hmm. uh, it's crazy. You know, um, we have such an amazing, amazing country. Here. And, you know, I've traveled a lot and we have so much good here, yep. so much we could do. So we just need the right direction and, you know, Kiwis would get behind it. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, what do they say? You know, uh, there's always, you know, there's always trouble with idle hands. Mm -hmm. So if people are working towards something collectively, then uh, we can do great things. So Okay. So when you first start with an organization, what is the first thing that you actually do? 
probably not rocket science, but the first thing I do is, uh, let's say I'm talking to the CEO, mm -hmm. and I'm talking to the CEO, and I say, okay, tell me what the problems are. And I wait for the CEO to start pointing fingers because this is the perfect moment. Oh, it's uh, the people. Oh, yeah, it's, it's the this. people, it's technology or someone in my team. Da, da, da. And then I say, okay, great, cool. So I'm just going to stop you there, make an intervention. So um, who recruited this person? Oh, I did. Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, <laughs> and, and who's leading this organization? Well, I am. Okay, okay, cool. So the first thing is to look in the mirror, yep. because if you're playing the blame game, then you can't be taking full responsibility for what you have created. Mm -hmm. Okay. And everyone has, you know, unless you're a brand new CEO and you're coming in and you've not been part of the problem, uh, there's, there's the issue straight away. So first of all, do you take responsibility and accountability for what has been created? Yeah. Because if you don't, you're not going to fix it. Mm -hmm. And the second thing then I do is, okay, cool. Now, what was your vision when you came here? Or what is your vision? What do you really want to create? Mm -hmm. what, would, what would amazing, what would exceptional look like to you? Not just ordinary, not just a little bit better. You know, shoot, sky's the limit. Because that stretch in consciousness helps people wake up. Because then they are held to a higher account. I yeah. say, okay, so if that now becomes your CEO, so you're no longer the CEO, but your dream is, and you report to that dream, then we start getting things really interesting happen, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm not really the CEO. I'm just a pair of, I'm just like a caretaker of that dream. Of that dream. Mm. And then, you know, quite often I'll, I'll have a, uh, a, you know, a meeting then with the exec team and, and have the same process with, with all of the exec team. So I sort of do a discovery process with all of the exec team, and then I'll put it all together and present it back to them. And, you know, often uh, I'll have a situation where I'll talk about, okay, so you're, you're all here now because you've fought your way to the top, right? Um, and that's what's got you here. But that's not going to get you to be a leader of an enterprise mm -hmm. because as a leader of an enterprise, you need to collaborate across the whole organization. Yes. And if you're not fully aligned and you're not got each other's backs, and you're not fully committed to each other's, you know, uh, success, mm -hmm. we have a problem. Right. So it's a little bit like I, I use an analogy, the difference between an Olympic team, which is flying the same flag, everyone's trying to get gold medals, right? And yeah. hey, we'll, we'll win, win, but you're winning for, the, for your discipline before you're winning for the country. Yeah. The winning for the country just happens to happen when you count up the medals. That's one form of team, but that's not the sort of team you need for an enterprise. Mm. You need a team that's collaborating like a football team or a netball team or a rugby team or, you know. They're all playing for the greater good. Yeah, so we've got a common shared greater good vision, goal, yeah. what they got good looks like. We're all playing different positions or different functions and then we go from there. I'd never <clears> thought <throat> about the Olympic team like that, but you're right. It's yeah. very, very different, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and... Um, uh, the other thing is, is um, you know, agile is very popular today as a word, yes. right? And I've seen lots and lots of agile implementations uh, around the world, successful and unsuccessful. And what happens is that a lot of companies are actually uh, structured like a matrix, right? So they'll have a functional accountability and they'll have a cross-functional accountability because mm -hmm. cross-function is usually how they launch products or uh, do things. And they want the organization to be more agile, but they put the structure in place, which is matrix, right? Mm -hmm. And agile and matrix have two fundamental different, <laughs> you well, know. Completely different ways of operating. Yeah, yeah, completely different ways of operating. So you have to, in order for the agile way to work inside of a matrix, it's the agile mindset, understanding how to work in a matrix organization. Mm -hmm. And in a matrix organization, it's always the cross points where the function meets the meets the cross function that you have an opportunity for conflict but you also have an opportunity for uh, creativity so you know what i teach people is how at that cross point to work collaboratively and to un unlock creativity or what we call collective intelligence rather than hit conflict mm. 
And then you unlock incredible value for the organization when you unlock this <clears throat> collaboration and collective intelligence. So I call it the collaborative advantage. I'm writing a book on that right okay. now. Okay, excellent. <laughs> yeah, oh, so yeah. when is that going to be released? Uh, probably next year, I'd say. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So um, first, you first heard it on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. I look forward uh, to that. Rather, because <laughs> I keep hearing people talking about competitive advantages, and that, yeah. I understand that. You yeah. know, what's what's what makes you different? What makes you stand out? What makes you different from your competitors? But um, all true enterprises are collaborative. Yeah. Because if you're not collaborative, you can't compete, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right? So collaborative is actually underpinning competitive. And it comes back to, you know, my love of nature. You know, as you know, I'm also big into sustainability, permaculture, regenerative agriculture, and um, that's really important to me. Yep. And if you look at natural systems, they're very much uh, collaborative systems. Mm. Um, and they can live in harmony which seems like competition. Yes. <laughs> uh, so it's pretty cool. Um, so that's that's the that's the basis of understanding this whole collaborative advantage that we have. Mm -hmm. And if you lose that and you start competing, particularly on the inside, yeah, you're going to be in trouble. Mm, okay. Well, I look forward to that book coming out. I want to take you back, if I may, to your original business in the recruitment business. Mm. I'm assuming because you, you had how many staff was it in the end? 600. 600 yeah. staff and 30 million dollars. Okay. Um, how quickly did you grow and what were the sort of the, um, the challenges you came well, across? Well, I had that business for 21 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So we went through three seven year, <laughs> three seven, seven year, year cycles. <laughs> yeah. We actually went through three, uh, three recessions fundamentally and the, and the first one was the most brutal right. because that was when i had about 40 people and we had to go down to seven yeah. and it was it was it was tough um and making those hard calls was probably the hardest thing i've ever had to do because you when you hand select 40 people they're your family <clears throat> they're your family mm -hmm. and you know that they have families and that times are tough and sure you can go through and say okay let's you know, look at the bottom 10% of performers and the top 10%, and you can do it that way. But when you're in a recession um, and things are going to change very quickly, negatively, uh, if you hold on too long, mm -hmm. you're going to run out of cash. Yeah. And that's the, that's the truth. And not that money's the purpose of business. Um, it's like the oxygen is mm -hmm. to living. So you need it to live. It's not the purpose of your life, but you need, you know, particularly nowadays in, in today's world, you need, you need cash to live. And, you know, um, that's just the fact of life. So that was the hardest thing I ever did probably in my whole career. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, how did you handle those conversations with people? Uh, with a lot of tears. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So it was one-on-one -on -one <laughs> yep. with every single person. Of and, of course, once you start, the word gets out mm -hmm. and you have to do it real quick and we knew we were going to have to do this for about three months and to be honest i delayed it longer than i should have yep um but uh and we made made sure that we did it at the optimal time for for people so yep. you know we had a long weekend coming up and so i just did everyone on a uh, a thursday and a friday personal conversation uh face to face in those days yep um, and that meant me traveling to them because we had uh, people in different uh, places. And so I went around and, and I did it. And uh, some people were really pissed off, uh, which was hard. Uh, and some people uh, took it well and some people collapsed. Mm. And you just think, wow, that was, that was me doing that. I had that ripple effect <clears throat> on people. And that was, that was tough. Mm. And that was a hard lesson. And, and the lesson from that is, is that grow responsibly mm -hmm. came from that. Grow responsibly and look at the macro trends. So, you know, I was very, you know, myopic in those days. I was yes. just looking at my business. How and was my, going, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't looking at what was happening in the macro environment. And so I missed what was happening in the macro environment. And I think as a leader, you need to understand your business yep. for sure you know, understand your marketplace, but understand also the macro environment about what's going to happen. And, and you make a call based on that. You're not always going to be right, but it, it's better to be uh, forearmed 
yeah, I would say if you've got a, um, you can have, then have, a, I always talk about having, you know, there's the main plan, but you have to have other plans that yeah. are there just in case. <clears throat> the plan B. Yeah, yeah. The, the smash in case of emergency kind of plan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Break and, glass here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You can't do that if you've done that. So um, we talked about this before we came to the podcast, so this whole macro, being really aware of the macro environment. Mm. Can you give me some examples of things people should be looking to in terms of understanding that macro environment? Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of good data in New Zealand if you read a lot of the bank reports, a lot of the bank economists. And and, and look, if you look at their ability to predict the future, <laughs> it's a little bit like the weather. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. We've been yeah. we've been predicting weather for like 150 years and we still can't get it right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> so you have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but if everybody is predicting, hey, things are going to get tougher, yeah. uh, and you're not an economist, mm -hmm. I would then go to an advisor and actually sit down with someone who really knows and say, hey, look, this is what my business, where my business is. Yeah. What do you think we should do to hedge for the future? Yeah. Uh, I was on a call this morning uh, with one of my clients in um, Southern California, in Brentwood, which is just uh, north of Santa Monica. Yep. And uh, the their business is down 66%. Mm -hmm. They're in the multifamily housing business and, and they do loans for, you know, the two, three hundred million uh, worth of property. Yep. And uh, on Tuesday, the new economic data is coming out mm. for the US. And so when that comes out, they'll know whether they need to make cuts or not. And that'll be that'll be sort of a quarter ahead right. yep. in the cycle. So they know if the economic data is good, mm -hmm. then we're okay. Yep. We'll probably start recovering. If it's neutral, we're probably okay. If it's negative, then they're pretty sure that the next quarter is going to be brutal yeah, and they can drop to. another 30%. And so they're going to have to make some hard calls. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, it's just about being prepared for that, isn't it? So, so yeah. it's better to not be blindsided, but actually knowing that that is a potential opportunity. And it may never happen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we didn't, no one knew about COVID. No one knew about yeah. where. <laughs> where it was going to, where it was going, what it was going to do and what it was, what the impacts were. But now we know enough mm -hmm. so that we can know that there, there will be an impact. You know, the global financial crisis, New Zealand weathered the storm very well yep. in that. And the government saying, hey, I think we'll weather this, uh, <laughs> this recession very well. And, and we very much could do. We might. We yeah. might. Yeah. But you've got to have a plan B, as you say, and maybe even a plan C. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe it's time to look at uh, I've been struggling with this business for a while uh, and maybe it's time to retire it because you've got to also know when to get out. Mm. Right. Because a, yeah. <laughs> a, a lot of a lot. I know a lot of um, small business owners love their businesses. It's, 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 it's a baby. It's a baby. Yeah. And maybe it's only paying them a wage plus. Right. You know, uh, and it's not really a business per se, mm -hmm. um, uh, but they need to go. Hey, is is am I am I prepared for you know more hard times? Have I got the energy? Have I got the motivation? Mm -hmm. uh, have I got the capital behind me if things go wrong? Yeah, it's really interesting. Gino, who you know wrote the EOS um, yeah. model and whatnot, he talks about the fact that in every ten years we generally have kind of you know. Um, a couple of good years, yeah. three or four kind of average years, and there's always one year in every 10 that yeah. has the potential to completely destroy you. Yeah, yeah. And you've got to be prepared for that. Uh, and yeah. it's naive to think that it's not going to happen. Yeah. And I think sadly a lot of, um, probably there's more of the small business owners, but even some of the medium-sized ones do get affected by it. You know, it's, it's that uh, they haven't got the plans in place. They haven't got that six months with the cash flow sitting in the bank ready to get yeah. them through it and, and yeah. having the plans to, to make decisions quickly. Because yeah. sometimes you have to, as you said, if you hadn't made those decisions quickly, sure, it affected a lot of people's lives, Lives, but it meant you could come back and you could yep. then affect a whole lot more lives going forward. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of those, a lot of the, uh, probably a third of those 40 people yeah. came back. Oh, yay. Yeah. Oh, that's good news. <laughs> Excellent. But, I mean, that was, that was the good news. But yeah. of course, you know, one, <sighs> sometimes you lose faith uh, with people. Yeah. And um, so uh, it's, you know, yeah. it's not good. It is what it is. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So I often ask, well, if I always ask, I guess, to give three kind of top tips. We like to be quite pragmatic on here. So if you think about, you know, our mid-sized kind of business owners, what are the three things that you've either learned from working in your own business or working with the amazing business you work with that you would take both from a personal and professional point of view? Well, 
one of the things that we do is we we say that there's the three levers of performance. Yep. And that's strategy, culture, and execution. Mm -hmm. Now I know EOS is probably one of the best execution platforms out on the planet. So <laughs> if you not if you haven't got really good execution, yep. then you need to really lean into that. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't got a really good culture that yep. supports the strategy, then you need to really lean into that because you're going to lose talent. And when you, when times are tough, you don't want to lose talent yep. because talent's usually the first people to go. Um, and then you can make sure you have a right strategy. Yeah. Right. So you've got a vision for who you want to be or what you want to become or what you want the business to do. Make sure you've got the right the right strategy. You, mm -hmm. You're going to do the right things because strategy is really just about choices. Yep. You know, you've got all these choices you could choose. Which ones are you going to choose? And maybe you'll choose them right. Maybe you'll choose them wrong. Um, and just a nuance within that strategy, many years ago, strategy used to be set for like five years, 10 years, right? You remember those yeah, days, yeah. the, the strategy <laughs> documents. Sadly, yeah. yes. <laughs> you know, and they sort of sat in the, the bottom drawer and they were, they came out once a year and people would say, oh yeah, we're pretty much on track, but no one measured it. Mm -hmm. Well, now you have to be much more agile with your strategy. So uh, what you have to do with strategy nowadays is relook at it every, every quarter. So every quarter I would say, and I know this is an EOS thing too, but yes. <laughs> uh, but it's just common sense. It's good business practice to get your leadership team together. Yep. And that doesn't just mean you're executive, by the way, no. because they aren't always the implementers. So get your wider leadership team together. Get them in a room and say, what are you feeling now? Where are we going? How are we tracking on track? What are the What's the data say? What does the market say? Yeah. Once a quarter. And if you just do that for a day or two, will transform your business so that's your strategy element yep your ex, your your, your culture, culture is what supports it culture is what supports it so yep. if your culture is not quite right um then you need to relaunch it mm -hmm. right and there'll be people in your culture and that's mindset mindset and behavior culture right it's the mindset of the people and the behavior of the people right yep. so if your mindset's not right you're not going to crack it mm -hmm. if the behaviors aren't right it's not going to crack it and the behaviors are also not only the things you do, uh, but the things you allow to be done, mm, yeah. <laughs> right? And a lot of people <laughs> miss this that. one. Yeah. You know, so if there's someone in the corner and they're performing quite well, but they're a bit of a shark yep. and they're using other people's resources and goodwill to actually drive their performance mm -hmm. and they're a bit of a silo, um, it's a hard one because they're performing, but the damage that they're doing long term yep. is what you have to look into. Mm -hmm. So strategy, culture, and then have very good execution, yep. very good execution. And we we have an execution uh, process, which we call moments of truth. Hmm. So we look out, you know, uh, 90 days and say, okay, what are the moments of truth that we have as an organization? And people might call it milestones, but there's lots of other moments of truth that could be like, uh, our long range plan, board presentation, mm -hmm. right? So there's moments of truth that are beyond just delivery milestones. Yeah. There's when we have to show up at our best, when we have to be exceptional. What are those moments of truth for our customers, mm -hmm. our people, our team, yeah. <laughs> you know, our teams, uh, for our, you know, investors? What are those moments of truth? And then we really nail those moments of truth. Mm -hmm. And if you get people focused on, you know, being exceptional at those times, the other things sort of like line up. Yeah. So those are the those are the three things that I'd say just focus on your strategy, yeah. get that right, the culture, get that right, and then your execution. And if you want an execution partner, I'm going to plug EOS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I haven't got to do that, but thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> well, Wait. The, the reason why I do plug it is because I've seen it in action. Yeah. So probably... Uh, I've I've got about five or six EO clients that run EOS at the moment, yep. and they're big clients and they love it. Yeah, you know they love it. It's it's like it's just a a, a process that really and a structure that really supports their execution. Yeah, you know, so I'm a big advocate of it. And you know, I know there's other methodologies out there, but um, and we always say like you just need to pick a system and stick with it. Yeah. So we'd love it to be EOS, of course, <laughs> yeah, of course. but it doesn't matter. No. Uh, you've got to just pick one, stick to it, and you'll get the results from yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's lots out there, and I work closely with uh, with YPO as well. Yeah. And you know, a lot of the YPOers will implement different models, or mm -hmm. they'll have their own model, or whatever it is. 
but it's the fact that they implement it like clockwork. Yeah. That's the thing that makes the difference. Yes. It's like consistency. Consistency. You're talking about the same thing. You allow room for sideways gravity mm -hmm. <laughs> to yeah. come in, right? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so it's not so tight that you can't allow for creativity or things that come out of the blue or yeah. people to speak up and just say, I don't know, my gut's telling me, you know, I've got to, you have to allow room for that, yeah. that element of human creativity and insight to creep into your system and then you can adjust, yeah. right? So don't try and suppress that, those views and that diversity, you okay. know, try and encourage it and, and have it, have it as a voice and go, yeah, bring it out. Let's hear what you, let's hear what you're thinking, right? Because yeah. it might be totally just imagination, yep. right? Oh, or there I, could be something in it. <laughs> or there could be something in it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we call collective intelligence. Yeah. Like why, why dumb down the room? Yes. when you can unlock it and unlock the potential. I, I, I give an example. I was working with a company the other day who actually um, does food manufacture stuff. So they've got a chef who's on the leadership team and we're having some issues financially. So we're talking about cash flow and financial stuff. And it was actually the chef that came up with the solution in the end. Yeah. Now, it wasn't his account area of accountability, responsibility, but nevertheless, because um, we're all working for the greater good, yep. we're all going, well, what, how can we contribute? And it's just that diversity of thought, I think, that yeah. can really challenge some of the things you do. Yeah, well, we're all in the same boat basically yep. and, and we should all be rowing in the same direction mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and um and if we are then everybody's voice is equal yep. um and you know at the end of the day the the role of the ceo or whatever it is is to to maybe take some hard decisions mm -hmm. but also to empower their team to take most of the decisions yep. and for their teams to empower most of their teams to take more of the decisions that are that are interfacing with your customers or your yep. clients or however you because they are their johnny on the spot yeah they're the representation of your entire yeah. business brand you yeah. Name it. I, yeah yeah i forget what was it mike tyson who said you know you can have you know, the fight plan can be as, as, as great until you get the first punch. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then you're like, whoa. Whoa. Yeah, I was expecting I wasn't, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a little bit life, like life. And it's, it's never a, never been a straight line for me. And I've never met anyone whose life has ever been a straight line. No, we kind of get taught that, you know, even with businesses, we've got that whole hockey stick growth thing. Yeah. I've never seen that in a business yet. No, <laughs> oh, no. No. I shouldn't say never. I have seen one outlier that definitely did do that. But in general yeah. terms, there's lots of little blips on the way. Yeah, it's yeah. like a whole regression analysis, isn't it? It's like this, <laughs> yeah. all these dots scattered across the line. You draw a straight line through it. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. for statistical purposes. Is that not life? <laughs> that's not life at all. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just really interested. I mean, I, I love the fact that you're talking about, you know, giving accountability back to people and putting it back on them i think mm. that's really important it's kind of like letting go but within the, the the boundaries and the things that you've set within your culture and within your measurables for my listeners who tend to be a little bit more mid-sized potentially mm -hmm. looking to grow into that next level up any kind of words of last words of advice for them in terms of because you know you had you had 600 staff that's a, a significant size business mm. when what had what changed was there anything that changed in between being a, a mid-sized to being a slightly larger business uh i well i think fundamentally I set the culture, mm -hmm. um, we set the vision, yep. and then we systematized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yep. <clears throat> I don't think you could, there's any magic, no. right? You can't scale a business when it's like you're, you're reinventing the wheel all the time. Yep. Like, yeah. Right. Well, how do we do this? How do we do Now, I'll tell you what, I was chatting to someone the other day, yep. and this is how bad their scaling is. Now, they've got 800 people. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were chatting on a completely different topic. So I was training these champions to go around and, and um, re-energize the business. We, right. we were getting them to talk about the vision, the strategy, uh, the values, and you know the finances and how to have low-cost or no-cost ideas, mm -hmm. right? Because the, the business was struggling. So I'm on the call there, and, and someone says, oh, one of the people in the workshop said, ah, oh, that's terrible. We need to get better systems. And she said, well, what's an example? She said, oh, I spent two weeks uh, creating this mail merge document to send out to all our drivers. And it took me ages. And I had to get all the emails and then send them out one by one. And she said, have you ever heard of this thing called mail merge? And she went, no. And she showed her this thing where she could import all of the all of the, the, email, the addresses. email addresses into one spreadsheet with pretty much pretty easy and then just press a couple of buttons off you go send it yeah and it went out by email and she was like oh my god i didn't know we could do that right mm -hmm. now <laughs> 
on the same call, <laughs> there was someone who said, yeah, I had the same thing in a, a workshop I did, and they didn't even know we had DocuSign. And the woman that <laughs> said in the other, <laughs> she said, <laughs> what's DocuSign? <laughs> Have we got DocuSign? Yeah. And he went, yeah. She went, oh, my God, I didn't know we had DocuSign. And they've been working together for four months. Right. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> And right, that's doesn't know what the left hand's the doing. Yeah. That's an example. If you don't systematize your business and, yep. and and that you'll never be able to scale it. So that would be my advice to, you know, that small to medium sized enterprise to really look at how are we going to scale, how are we going to yep. automate things, how do we do things that still deliver to the customer experience, that still deliver to the people experience, but take away all that friction that's unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Um because as you know, one of the other things that I do is I'm a, I'm a flow coach, yes. right? So, and flow is all about, one of, the, one of the elements is about taking friction out of your life. Mm -hmm. So when you wake up in the morning, if you've got 15 decisions before you can even get out the door, yeah. you've just wasted a huge part of your mental capacity, right? Yes. You're going to be exhausted getting out the door. You're going, oh my God, thank <laughs> God. I got, you know, get into the car. You think, oh my God, yeah. I can have a rest on the way to work, right? You're already fried. Yeah. And it's just simple things, isn't it? When, like, I actually have a uniform. Right. Um, I have a uniform for work. And yeah. it, it's, you know, just a, a handful of dresses and always the same jewellery and always it's just consistent. Yeah. Which means in the morning I wake up and I go, right, pick a dress, put on the jewellery. Yeah, yeah, you've got off I go. Yeah. yeah. Three or four choices at max. Yep. And then, you know, That's similar it. sorts, you know, three or four choices for breakfast and just get on with it because, you know, what you look like and what you eat for breakfast, sure, what you eat for breakfast, nutrition is important. Sure. But, but, you know, if you're wanting to make a difference in the world, mm -hmm. then, the time that you've got to make a difference, that's where you want to be in flow. Yeah. That's where you want to be at your best. That's what you want to be exceptional at. Mm -hmm. So all the other bits and pieces, take out the friction, yeah. you know, take out all the friction. And, you know, if you, if you spend all your day in the, in the, in the morning, uh, <laughs> one client I had recently here in New Zealand, what he did, he said, oh, you know, I've got a good routine in the morning. I said, oh, what do you do? He said, well, I get up in the morning. I get up about like 5.36, I go down, I make myself a copy, I grab the Herald and I sit in bed and read the Herald. And then, you know, da, 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 and I say, I said, oh, okay, cool. How do you feel at the end of that? He says, yeah, I feel a bit, I, I feel a bit tired. And I'm yeah. like, dude, you have just wasted the, fur, the best 90 minutes of, of your, your morning. Day. Yeah, reading, news, reading doom and gloom. Doom and gloom, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, shit, I hadn't thought of that. I said, you've got dogs, haven't you? And he goes, yeah. And I said, okay, so tomorrow... What I want you to do is get up in the morning, don't have a coffee first thing yep. for a start, just get some blue light and because that's a stimulant, yep. you know, getting out in the morning. Take your dogs for an hour's walk or 45 minutes walk and just, just whistle along and play, meet other people and, and, and get yourself some exercise. Yep. Then come back. What are you going to nail this day? Well, how are you going to win the day? How are you going to win the week? <laughs> right? Think about that. Grab yourself a coffee and then do your most creative, high value work right, while you've got yeah. all of your attention freed up. You're in the best energy space you possibly could be. Yeah. And, it, and it, that's some, and I didn't charge him for this, by the way. He paid for lunch, though. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he called me back later and he said, That's changed my life. Yeah. You know? So I, sorry, I actually, the Herald, no, <laughs> we've no. lost you a reader. But. <laughs> I actually, I, mean, I used to be an avid watcher of the news, but the first thing I do when I get home from work in the evening, I mean, even um, video on my sky uh, yeah. and then watch it. And I suddenly realized it, it wasn't doing any good and I stopped doing all of that. And we now do go for a walk every morning with the dogs, right. rain, hail or shine. We bought ourselves some great wellies and we go out yeah. and we splash in the puddles. And I tell you what, it is just the best way to start the day. Yeah, and and you when can, you don't do it, that's when you actually feel a bit bleh. Yeah, yeah, and you can talk about, you can talk about the business or ideas. Hey, yeah. you know, like it, it, that's why ideas come to you when you're relaxed. Yeah. Because as soon as you relax, you shut down this prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. which is your thinking brain or the CEO brain, and you access your pattern recognition system. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, ideas come. So you're in the shower, like, ah, da, 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 da. Ah. And, wow. You know, quickly write it on the mirror or something. Um, yes. Or, you know, you're going for a walk or. Uh, you know, uh, you meet a friend uh, and you just have such good energy. Mm -hmm. You're in the car on the way back. You think of a new idea. Yeah.
No, completely agree. I did actually I had another podcast guest who talked all about that stuff, and I was blown away. But I remember you were doing the talk at the Connected Communities. I mean, yeah. again, it was uh, there was something that really struck me, and I've completely forgotten it now. But it was just around that that whole flow is like not uh, not wasting yeah. that that perfect time. Yeah. Hey, look, I know we could talk for hours because we, we already have. Um, but I also know you've got a huge amount of resources available that can actually help people. I mean, you've yes. got some great case studies on your website. You've got. Um, have you already written a book? Or is this going to be your first book? Uh, this is my first real book. I, got- I wrote. A, I wrote. A, I wrote Wrote a short book for my TED talk. Oh yeah, yeah. So ah, your TED talk. So what is your TED talk title? Uh, it, it's the TED talk is title is "What's Really Killing Us," ah. because I I did that in 2014. Yep. And what I saw was, you know, and through my experiences, how people are suffering at work, and work is not engaging or inspiring for most people. Most people, it's clock in, clock out. Mm -hmm. And you can see that from the research from Gallup, for example, you know, it was like 60% of people, all they do is clock in and clock out just to get a paycheck. This is global. I can't, I can't get my head around that, but I I, I can, I can appreciate it. Yeah. And then then there's like, you know, 15% of people are actually going the extra mile and there's a whole bunch of other people Mm -hmm. that actually are undermining the business. Right. And this was global statistics. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you just look at that and that's what you see inside organizations they're 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 just operating at mediocre uh they can't stand the next meeting they they sort of check out in meetings and they check out at work they get the paycheck but they're not happy yeah and that's what i saw around the world and so someone asked me to speak at a ted talk and that was the the title of my talk right. that was what is really killing us mm-hmm. and it's a four-letter word called work <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And it's just the way that work is set up. And yeah. we, we can set up work so much differently yep. to be exceptional, to be excited. Not, I mean, not every day. We all still have to fill in our tax forms and stuff yep. and whatever. Um, but those are the small things. Mm-hmm. You know, don't let those small things distract us from the bigger game, which is how much impact we can make and, and how much we can change things or how much value we can add to clients and yep. how excited they feel when they're using our product or service. That, that's, that's great when you see the spark in the eyes and stuff. Like, that's what we're here for. Yep. So where can that, well, I'll put the TED Talk link in the podcasting as well. Where can people find more information about you and how can they contact you? So I'm on LinkedIn as Liam Ford. Yep. Uh, we've also got a Zone Global LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can follow us on there or you can uh, look at the website, which yep. is, www.thezone.co. Co. Okay. Yeah, dot co. Dot com was taken by the diet people. <laughs> oh, was that, of course, the zone. Well, yeah. <laughs> when I started the zone, I was in New Zealand. I didn't think of dot com yep, back yeah. then. <laughs> so that was like 20 odd years ago. Okay. So the zone.co. Excellent. And LinkedIn for both yourself personally and also for the company yes, as well. Yes, absolutely. Now, I'd give you my email and a phone number, but you'd probably swamp me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so hey, look, really, really appreciate you coming in. Um, a, spending some time with me before this, but also giving you time for the podcast. I have to say, it's great to be back in person again. So, yeah, isn't it? yeah the energy is always a little bit different i think so yeah yeah and you've got such a great setup here for uh for podcasts too yeah. you've got a great set great setup here too i'll probably steal it from you one day <laughs> <laughs> no worries at all hey look thank you very much for coming in um for sharing all your wisdom and whatnot look forward to talking in soon yeah well, obviously it's uh been a pleasure and i'm sure we're gonna co- collaborate collaborate together and and do some great great stuff let's make a huge difference we'd love to do that yeah. thank you thanks cool thank you